Okay, hello everybody. Uh, today we have Emmanuel Milman from the Technion, um, who will speak to us uh, on multi-bubble asperometric problems, old and new problems. So Emmanuel, thank you very much for uh, uh, agreeing to talk and please. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to speak about uh, this work, which is uh, joint, uh, some of it's still in progress, together with uh, Joe Neyman from, uh, from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, so yeah, so it pertains to isoparametric problems. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yeah. You can hear me, yes? Just to make sure. Okay, great. So I need, uh, it makes sense to maybe start the talk with uh, kind of reminding us of the uh, classical isoparametric inequality uh, in Euclidean space Rn, uh, which goes back uh, at least maybe in dimension two or three uh, to the ancient Greeks. Uh, which is the well-known uh, statement that among all sets in Rn having a given volume, uh, Euclidean balls minimize surface area. Uh, so what do I mean uh, by these uh, notions? Of course, by, by sets, I mean uh, measurable sets, let's say let's say Borel measurable. Uh, by volume, of course, I mean uh, n-dimensional Lebesgue measure. But what do I mean by surface area? This maybe deserves a few moments of reflection because there are actually various uh, non-equivalent uh, definitions of surface area which one can use. Uh, of course, when the boundary of the, of the set is smooth, and of course, all of these different possible definitions will coincide, but in general, they will be different. And you see, I wrote some bunch of candidates for being uh, the definition of surface area. You don't really have to take a close look at it. Uh, the one that we're going to uh, use is uh, the strongest of them all. So since we're looking for lower bounds on the surface area, by strongest, I mean that this definition gives you something which is smaller or equal to all of these other possible candidates. And it is given by the so-called de Georgi perimeter. Uh, so there are various uh, possible equivalent geometric and analytic definitions of perimeter. Uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, get too technical, uh, but let me just give you kind of a definition with a geometric flavor. It is just equal to the n minus one dimen uh, how, uh, dimensional uh, Hausdorff measure of not the topological boundary of the set omega, but rather the so-called reduced boundary of the set, which I denote here by partial star of omega. Uh, what is this? Well, this is a subset of the topological boundary, possibly a strict subset. Um, and this basically uh, uh, is the collection of all points where omega has a well-defined uh, uh, unique unit outer normal. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a definition we're going to use. Uh, and, and, and what I mean, uh, it has a well-defined unit normal, I mean, in a certain measure theoretic sense, which I don't uh, describe here, okay? Uh, the only thing we really need to know about this definition uh, is the very useful property, which is that it is invariant under null set modifications of the set omega. In other words, if you change omega by volume zero, then the perimeter stays exactly the same, and also the reduced boundary. Okay, so this uh, is just the only thing we, we're going to need for the rest of the talk, okay? Good, so this is, of course, the situation in your classical situation in Rn, but of course, you can study isoparametric problems in more general metric measure spaces. So, for example, you can start with a nice, smooth Riemannian manifold, M, and you can, in fact, use uh, some positive, strictly positive, smooth, smooth density psi. And then you can define the corresponding uh, notions of weighted volume and weighted surface area by doing exactly what we did before, just using the density psi to weigh everything here, okay? Now, having the notions of volume, weighted volume and weighted area, you can consider the corresponding isoparametric problem. Uh, so the only two examples that are going to be relevant for us besides uh, Rn in this talk are going to be the following classical spaces. The first is, I'll denote this by Sn. This is just a canonical unit sphere, n-dimensional sphere, uh, and it's canonical embedding in Rn plus one. Uh, and as the measure, we're just going to take convenient normalization is we're going to take the uniform measure on the sphere. So we just normalize to make it into a probability measure, just for convenience. Uh, and then this is uh, by now a classical result, 100, almost 100 year old result due to Paul Levy and Schmidt, who showed that uh, as one, would expect uh, geodesic balls are isoparametric minimizers. Okay. Uh, the second space we're interested in this talk today is, uh, I'll denote this by GN, is the standard Gaussian space. So you endow Euclidean space Rn with a standard uh, Gaussian probability measure. 
Okay, and now this is again a classical binary result, uh, only 50 year old result due to Sudokov and Cyrilson and independently due to Borel from 75, who showed that in this case, half spaces are isoparametric minimizers. So among all sets having a given Gaussian volume, uh, half spaces minimize Gaussian surface area. Remember, you have to weigh everything now with respect to the Gaussian density. Uh, so if this, this is the, probably in this seminar, this is not the first time you've seen this, but if by some chance this is, then uh, you may be surprised because what happened to the geodesic balls. But really the moral here is that you should think of these half spaces as being balls with center at infinity, okay? So in other words, it's a good idea to think of the boundary of these half spaces, which are just flat hyperplanes as being generalized spheres with zero curvature, okay? And this is how we're going to think about this. Okay, so of course, isoparametric inequalities are uh, crucially used in various branches of mathematics, like, of course, geometry, but also analysis, PDE, probability, combinatorics, and so on. So uh, these are important uh, things to, to know and study. Um, but in this talk, we're going to talk about isoparametric problems for clusters. What is a cluster? Uh, a cluster omega is a partition of the underlying space into a fixed number, let's call this number Q, of cells. So omega 1, omega 2, through omega Q. So that when, when I say partition, uh, I mean everything is up to null sets. So the union of these cells cover the entire space up to null sets, and they are pairwise disjoint up to null sets. Okay. Notice that there is no uh, requirement that uh, these cells should be connected or anything like that, just general uh, uh, measurable sets. Uh, well, with with finite perimeter uh, or locally finite perimeter. Uh, okay, so now to study the corresponding isoparametric problems, uh, we need to understand what is now the volume and what is the surface area. So now the volume of the cluster becomes a vector of volumes, just the volumes of the individual cells. And the isoparametric problem consists of uh, looking at all clusters having a prescribed vector of volumes and trying to minimize the surface area. So we, we still need to minimize a scalar quantity. So the most natural thing to do is just to sum up the individual surface areas of each of the cells. Okay, so this is this expression. Okay, and we divide by two. This is, of course, uh, doesn't do anything for the minimization problem. This is just some convenient normalization. And equivalently, it's not hard to show that this is the same as uh, the total surface area is just the same as uh, going over all pairs of cells i smaller than j, and considering the interface between the ith and jth cell and calculating the surface area of that and then summing everything together, okay? So now this is the challenge. And really with this problem, this isoparametric problem for clusters, the cells are incentivized in this way to kind of clump together in order to save on the overall uh, total surface area, okay? So now the problem, uh, we're, we're expecting them to clump together. So notice that uh, the previous examples that we've seen so far exactly correspond to the case Q equals two, because uh, we have our, cell, our set U and its complement, this will be the, the second cell, right? So this is exactly uh, Q equals two. Uh, and uh, the interface between the omega one, the first cell and the second cell is exactly the, uh, the, the surface, the usual surface area of the set U. Okay, so this exactly corresponds to the classical situation, which we'll call the single bubble case, because we basically have just one bubble, and we're interested in the multi-bubble case when Q is at least three. And specifically, the case Q equals three is called the double bubble case, because we have two bubbles, omega one, omega two, and their complement. Okay, so notice that there's like a shift of one between how we call this in words and the actual value of Q. So this is double bubble is Q equals three, the single bubble is Q equals two. Okay, this is because we're also counting this extra uh, complement cell. Okay, so this is the typical terminology in the business. So, uh, you know, it's not a big deal and uh, let, let's just get used to that, okay? Okay, so what is known about the double bubble problem? And, and by the way, if you have any questions or anything like that, please, please ask. Please. Okay, so uh, what is known about the double bubble problem? And uh, let's start with Rn. So in Rn, this is nowadays uh, a well-resolved theorem, which states that for all vectors of prescribed volumes, 
V1, V2, and of course, the uh, there's always going to be the complement is always going to have infinite volume. Then the standard double bubble minimizes total surface area. What is this? Of course, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. In this case, it's actually a photograph. So this is a photograph, uh, real real world photograph actually uh, uh, of a double bubble. So the first cell is given by the air trapped in this big soap bubble. The second cell is the air trapped in this little soap bubble. And of course we have the air in the exterior part uh, which has infinite volume, okay? Uh, to describe the structure, it's actually more convenient to describe the structure of the boundary. So the boundary of this double bubble consists of three spherical caps. So let's count them. One, the big one, right? Two, this one. And notice that there's also a third one protruding inside, right? And in, in this example, actually, they all have three different curvatures. So these three spherical caps are going to meet along an n minus two dimensional sphere. So this photograph is three dimensional, so they should meet along an S1. And indeed here you can see that they meet along this kind of S1. And they do so at 120 degree angles, which means that if you take any meeting point like this point, and you blow this image up, the tangent spaces here are going to meet exactly at 120 degree angles, as you can hopefully see from this image. We'll, we'll, we'll see some extra, uh, more example, more, more uh, images later on. Okay. So this is the theorem. Uh, the history is that this was first proved in the plane by Frank Morgan's undergraduate group in the early 90s. Uh, some of you may know that isoparametric problems are typically easier in the plane, in the two-dimensional situation. Uh, so this was indeed done by, by uh, first. Uh, but already the three-dimensional case posed a much greater challenge. Even for the equal volume case, when the two bubbles are assumed to have the same volume, V1 equal to V2, this was a major breakthrough by Huss, Hutchings, and Schlafly. Uh, uh, but the final resolution in R3 came in this analyst paper uh, by Hutchings, Morgan, Ritter, and Ross in the year 2000. They resolved the three-dimensional case. Uh, and later on, their method was extended uh, to R4 and later Rn by Reichard and his collaborators. Okay, so nowadays, this is completely resolved in Rn. Uh, what about our other two spaces of interest? Well, on the sphere, on SN, uh, we, until recently, this was a conjecture still. So this is the double bubble conjecture, which states or stated that for all vectors of prescribed volumes, V1, V2, and V3, which of course sum up to one because the total mass of the sphere is equal to one, then the standard double bubble should minimize the total surface area. What is this? Well, that's exactly as in the Euclidean setting, just three spherical caps meeting at 120 degree angles. Okay, this is natural conjecture. Uh, and again, the two-dimensional case was resolved by masters, but already in dimension three, uh, this was uh, open. Uh, in dimension three, there were some strong partial results, but uh, the general result in dimension N uh, was due to Corneli, Corwan, Hoffman, and uh, seven additional authors. I, I apologize for not writing all the names, uh, but basically what these authors showed is that if you're close enough to the equal volume case, to the one-third, one-third, one-third case, and by close enough, I mean up to 4%, then this conjecture holds true. But otherwise, it was open. Okay, so this is the double bubble conjecture on SN. Uh, and finally, what is the double conjecture on, on GN, on Gaussian space? This uh, was that for all vectors of prescribed volumes, uh, V1, V2, and V3 summing up to one, the standard tripod or Y shape should minimize the total surf Gaussian surface area. So remember, uh, when we pass from the spherical setting to the Gaussian setting, we're expecting the interfaces to flatten out, just as they do in the single bubble set, uh, situation, right? In the classical situation. So the conjecture is that, let's say in the plane, the boundary of the optimal configuration should look like this, just three half lines meeting at a point at 120 degree angles. And if you want to understand what it should look like in a run, you just take a Cartesian product of this image with our n minus two. Okay, so for example, in dimension three, it should look like this, just the standard uh, Y shape. Okay. So this was the conjecture and the best known result uh, was due again to the same group of 10 authors who proved exactly the same result in the Gaussian setting. So it's not really surprising. They got the same result on SN and on GN. They actually used very nicely this well-known interaction between the two spaces because as 
probably many of, uh, of the goers of this seminar know, uh, you can uh, obtain the Gaussian measure by starting with a high dimensional sphere, appropriately rescaled, projecting down the uniform measure on this high dimensional sphere onto a fixed little n dimensional subspace, you're going to get some measure which will converge uh, to the Gaussian measure. And this way you can transfer uh, iso various, uh, uh, various inequalities including isoparametric inequalities from the sphere to the Gaussian. Okay, and this is actually how the, the original proof of Sudokon Sirilson and Burrell actually went using this, this uh, well-known uh, uh, idea. Okay, so uh, this is why they got the same result. Okay, any questions about these conjectures? Okay, if not, this, these are the double bubble conjectures. What about, I, yes, sorry. Sorry, here in the interaction that you say from SN to GN, you move by projection in the right. same, right? You, okay, so from SN to G little n, you can move by projection. How on earth do you go back? You the, the, They go back just not for the isoparametric problem, but, but uh, some type of calculation they needed to do, which was convenient to do in the, for the Gaussian. Uh, they didn't, they didn't transfer uh, you know whatever they could prove for the Gaussian to the sphere this in this direction it doesn't work but the, you can transfer some calculation if you want okay you can approximate some calculation on the sphere by that on the Gaussian and then the implication that you say if you have it for large dimensions you can prove it for any dimension is that newer or is it already in the proof? No, no, no. So, so again, they're doing something specific, but the general fact is that if we knew uh, some conjecture, so some type of functional inequality on spheres of arbitrary large dimension, we could transfer them to uh, Gaussian of any dimension. I see. At least, okay. At mm -hmm. least the isoparametric problem. Okay. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, what about higher order? Okay, we want to go even to our order. And, and the point is then when the number of bubbles is too large with respect to the dimension, there's actually not really a reasonable conjecture even that one can make. So I took this image from a very nice paper by Cox, Grainer, et al. Uh, so they ran some computer simulations just in the plane. Uh, so in case R2 and just for the equal volume case. So all, all finite volume bubbles have the same volume. They ran some, um, you know, some optimization to see what is probably the minimizer. And in the beginning, when the number of bubbles is not too large, you can see some patterns. I would say that all the way up to eight bubbles, you definitely, you know, feel confident that this is probably the right minimizer. But afterwards, you know, you, don't, you it's, things start to get a bit amorphous. It's not really, really clear what is going on. Um, and the, there's not even a reasonable conjecture that one could make. Um, okay, but however, when the number of bubbles is not too large, specifically when the number of finite volume bubbles, which is Q minus one, is at most the dimension N plus one, there's a beautiful conjecture by John Sullivan that the minimizer should be a standard bubble. Okay, what is this? So as usual, let's start with a photograph. This is a beautiful photograph uh, of, a, of a triple bubble as we were all familiar with from, you know, blowing soap bubbles in our backyard. Right, uh, this photograph is a bit misleading because you might think that the interfaces in the interior are flat or something, but no. So if you take a cross section of this image, then you will see that the interfaces in the interior are, are also curved. Uh, but as you can expect, uh, these guys meet at 120 degree angles whenever they meet in threes. I'll explain why this is uh, always an, uh, uh, a necessary condition for being a minimizer, okay? Uh, that's one thing to notice. And another thing to notice is that there is no apparent convexity in this problem, right? So this cell is not convex. This cell, this is protruding inside a bit. So this cell is not convex. Okay, the little bubble is convex, but otherwise no apparent convexity in this problem. Okay, so this is how the triple bubble should look like. Uh, this is how the quadruple bubble should look like. So this is already a computer simulation of a very nice quadruple bubble. And you know, all of these images make perfect intuitive sense, but how on earth do you even define this in general, right? Uh, so this is Sullivan's beautiful idea. He suggested to do the following. So we're interested in constructing these bubbles in our N, but first let's start with SN, with a sphere, and consider Q equidistant points on the sphere. So of course, whenever the number of points, the sphere lies in our N plus one, right? So then whenever the number of points is smaller or equal to the dimension plus one, which explains exactly this, this uh, restriction on the, on the range of parameters of Q, 
uh, you can always find such Q equal distance points because you, you just take the vertices of a regular simplex in our n plus one, right? And by rescaling them, of course, you can always make them lie on a unit sphere, okay? So you take these Q equal distance points on the sphere and you consider the corresponding Voronoi cells on the sphere. We'll talk a bit more about Voronoi cells later on, but for now, let me just uh, look at this example. So you take four points on S2. So this point, this point in the back, this point in the front, and this point in the bottom. So these are uh, equidistant points. And you consider the Voronoi cells. So you get this cell, this, that, and the bottom cell. So you get this beautiful uh, equipartition of S2 into four equal parts, right? Now, what do you do with them? So Sullivan says, apply all possible stereographic projections from Sn to Rn. So I think I have a kind of a, a nice movie to show you. Here's the movie. It's a credit goes to Quanta Magazine. It's not ours. So you take all possible stereographic projections and you're going to get various possible configurations for your, in this case, triple bubble. So what is a stereographic projection? You just uh, embed your sphere SN in any way that you want, in any orientation, in any location in our N plus one. You put a lamp on the North Pole, which casts light, and you consider the shadow which it casts in our end. Okay, and of course, using different orientation. I should do this. No. Yes, I should do this. Okay. Um, so this is the idea. And why is uh, this uh, the suggestion? Well, it's because uh, stereographic projection have several great properties. First of all, they preserve sphericity. So if you have a spherical interface, you're also going to get a spherical interface after the projection, which is what you want to see. Another great property is that stereographic projections are conformal maps. They preserve angles. So if you had 120 degree angles on the sphere, you're also going to get 120 degree angles after the projection. Okay, 120 degree angles whenever three interfaces meet. And lastly, uh, the nice thing about this is that uh, Sullivan's construction is maximally clamped, uh, uh, clumped together in the sense that all pairs of cells meet each other on a non-empty interface. And this is also going to be preserved after you project down to our end. So in sense, uh, on a combinatorial level, this is the minimal complexity configuration where every cell meets uh, its, 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 its neighbor. Okay, which intuitively is what you're expecting should be the minimizing configuration. Oops, I keep doing the same. Yeah. Okay, so this is the construction. The only thing which is not clear is how do you know that you're going to get all possible volumes in this way? And this was actually worked out by Montesino Samilibia using a nice topological argument. You could show that indeed standard bubbles always exist and are uniquely determined, of course, up to isometries for all prescribed vectors of volumes. Okay in this exact range, okay? So this is a very uh, well-defined posed conjecture, okay? Questions about this? Okay, what is the corresponding conjecture on Sn, the sphere? It's exactly the same as before. So now that we know how to construct these uh, 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 standard bubbles on our n, we just apply all possible stereographic projections back to Sn, and this, uh, again, uh, th this gives you the, the, the family of uh, conjectured minimizers on the sphere. Okay, so for example, this is the uh, standard uh, triple bubble on S2, right? So you have tri white triple because you have one, two, three, and you have the exterior part. So this is Q equals four. Okay, so it looks something like this. Okay, what is the conjecture in the Gaussian setting? Here, it's a bit different. Uh, here, uh, as long as Q is at most N plus one, not N plus two, as we've seen so far, but N plus one, the conjecture is that for all vectors of uh, prescribed volumes, uh, summing up to one, the minimizer should be a standard simplicial cluster. What is this? So you take your Q equidistant points, but now they're in Rn, not Rn plus one, which explains why you get this slightly different range of parameters. You get your Q equidistant points, you consider their Voronoi cells, which are going to have flat interfaces, which is exactly what you, you want to see. You want to see flat interfaces for your minimizer. And the point is by, remember, of course, that the Gaussian measure is not translation invariant. So if you translate your Q equidistant points to some good location, 
It turns out using again a nice topological argument that you can hit your favorite vector of volumes uh, that you would like. Okay, so by translating it appropriately, you get a well-posed conjecture, and that should be the standard uh, 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 the, the, the conjecture minimizer. Okay. So these are our three conjectures on our NSMGN. The case Q equals true, remember, corresponds to the classical well-known single bubble case, which has been known for 50 or 100 years. The case Q equals three in our N uh, was known is the double bubble theorem, but it was a conjecture still in uh, for GN and SN, at least in dimension three and higher. Uh, the only other higher order case uh, it was in the plane, so R2, and the triple bubble case was uh, previously known and resolved by Wichi Ramallah. But I'm not aware of any uh, prior uh, results for the higher order case prior to uh, 2018 when Joe and I started to uh, to work on this problem. Okay. So, what are our results? Okay, let's start with uh, this. Was the, the conjecture uh, in the Gaussian setting, and a few years ago, uh, some four years ago, together with Joe, we were able to completely resolve. So the conjecture in all ranges of parameters is indeed true. A standard simplicial Q cluster is indeed a Gaussian minimizer. Uh, but you may wonder, okay, maybe there's some additional uh, configurations which attain the minimum, and the answer is no. These are actually we have the corresponding uh, uniqueness statement. These are the unique minimizers of Gaussian perimeter up to, of course, null sets. Okay, so this completely resolves the, the conjecture um, um, in the Gaussian set. Okay, so see, there's are already some old results. What about some new results? Uh, so these were the conjectures on our N and on SN. And uh, this year, getting together with Joe, we we're able to resolve these conjectures, but unfortunately, not in all ranges of parameters. So first of all, we cannot go all the way up to the maximal uh, allowed value for Q. So we cannot go all the way up to N plus two. We have to stop at N plus one. And okay, you know, I, I could still live with that, but it, uh, unfortunately we actually have to stop at six, at Q equals six. So in other words, we prove the double bubble. Uh, okay, in our end, this was already known, the double bubble theorem, but uh, uh, the double bubble uh, conjecture on the sphere uh, is new. We resolve triple bubble conjecture uh, on our n and on Sn in dimension three and higher, the quadruple bubble conjecture on our n and Sn in dimension four and higher, and the quintuple bubble conjecture in dimension five and higher. And unfortunately, for now, that's all. Uh, however, already let me say that we do actually have some strong, rather very strong partial results which are valid for all ranges of Q all the way up to N plus one. So we don't have to stop with quintuple, you can go higher, uh, but unfortunately these are not enough to fully resolve the conjecture, just almost, I'll explain what I mean later on. Uh, and what about the corresponding uniqueness statement? Well, uh, on the sphere, we have the uniqueness statement whenever we can, you know, in the same range of parameters that we can prove the result. But on our N, we actually don't have uniqueness for quintuple. So it's a bit strange, right? And it really seems like something else is going on uh, with respect to the Gaussian setting where we could do everything. Okay, so I'll try to explain uh, why this is different as we go along. Okay, so any questions about the results? Uh, since you stopped for questions, well, uh, yeah. for uh, Aren, you don't have uh, uniqueness when uh, Q reaches six because the, the methods don't adapt as well, or you don't know. Oh, okay, okay. So, so uh, from Q equals six, the method that we think should work for SN, but right now we can only make it work for Q equals six, but we think we're just kind of stuck for a long, long time. We're almost there, but not quite. Uh, we think the method should work for all of this range. Uh, the method on SN, this method, will, uh, which I'll describe at the end of the talk, does not apply in our N. The way we get the result in our N is by taking a scaling, uh, a limiting argument, right? Because if, uh, of course, the case of SN implies that of our N. It actually implies the Gaussian case because this was your previous question. So I should mention, if we the SN is formally harder than all of the other two step settings, right? Because if we know the result for SN in arbitrary high dimension, we can use this projection and get the Gaussian case, right? But without the uniqueness, because along the approximation, we'll use the uniqueness. Okay, so this does not, this will not give us uniqueness for the Gaussian. Uh, and the same type of argument will show us that SN 
implies uh, the case of Rn, well, not the same argument, but the same logic, because uh, Rn is scale invariant, right? It doesn't matter if you measure your, your volume in centimeters uh, cubed or in millimeters cubed, right? Uh, so this means if you start with a candidate cluster in Rn and you shrink it down to a very tiny cluster, and now you embed it in Sn, then of course you're going to get a little bit of error in your volume in your surface area, but this volume can be made to go to zero, this error. Okay, and so this means that if you know the result on Sn, you're going to, just by scaling invariance, to get the result on Rn as well. And this is how we actually get uh, the result for Q equals six on Rn, but without uniqueness, because this approximation procedure, again, will destroy uh, any chance of getting the uniqueness statement, okay? So the we, we have kind of an idea how to do things, just we're not able to do it all the way on Sn, and our plan is then to deduce the case in Rn without uniqueness by approximation. Did that make sense? Okay. More questions? Okay, so these are our results. Uh, yeah, so let's let's uh, see what we can do. I'm of course way I'm running out of time, but okay, now now it's just bonus time talking about the proof. So what are some tools that are used uh, in isoparametric problems to, to to resolve them? Of course, in the single bubble setting, there's an abundance of tools. I'll just I'll, I'm just name dropping here. You don't really have to read. Uh, there's many many tools that one can use to resolve the single bubble case. But not, most of these tools actually do not quite survive when you pass even to the double bubble setting. So let's take a look at how the double bubble proof uh, went by Hutchings, Morgan, Ritman, and Ross. Uh, the first tool that they, these authors used was geometric measure theory, which is a very deep and uh, uh, um, prolific theory uh, designed to study uh, geometric variational problems, and specifically it uh, um, um, uh, establishes the existence and regularity of uh, isoparametric minimizers. Of course, uh, this is a theory developed by many, many people like Georgi, Federer, Fleming, Ongren, and many others. Uh, so of course, uh, this is a powerful tool which we'll also uh, want to use. Uh, another tool which was used by these authors is symmetrization. Again, symmetrization is a classical tool in the single bubble setting, but in this setting, they were actually using symmetrization in a rather sophisticated manner, uh, suggested by Brian White and developed by Michael Hutchings. Uh, and this symmetrization argument will tell us that actually our minimizing double bubble will have the, the two the two bubbles will have a common axis of symmetry. Okay, so this basically reduces the question to the two-dimensional question. And once you know how the two-dimensional picture looks like, you just kind of rotate around your axis of symmetry using the orthogonal group and you get the picture in our end. Okay. So now this is a two-dimensional problem, right? So but what's the big deal? I said just a few minutes ago that two-dimensional problems are typically easier. And it turns out that this is not so easy because no one told you in advance that the bubble should be connected. And maybe it's advantageous for them to split into several connected components, as you see in this uh, picture. Uh, and maybe this, uh, you know, this allows them to save on the total surface area. Who knows? So uh, for this reason, Hutchings developed uh, some type of uh, uh, connected component analysis, which tries to bound, to give upper bounds on the number of connected components that one could have. Uh, this works in certain situations, but not in others. And at the end, the kind of the, 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 the hard work was left for Hutchings, Morgan, Ritter, and Ross, who needed to rule out various competitors by rather ad hoc arguments. So they would look at some type of uh, possible two-dimensional picture and say, well, this cannot be a minimizer because this reason, and maybe this cannot be a minimizer because of some other reason, and so on. And at the end, they were left with just the uh, uh, minimizing uh, cluster, which should be connected, both bubbles should be connected, and then it's rather easy to show that these must be the standard double bubble, okay? So the key uh, thing was to show the connectedness of the bubbles. Uh, there's actually an alternative proof discovered later on by Gary Lawler uh, using so-called metacalibrations or, or unification method, which I don't know, don't know too much about, so let me not, not, not say more than that. Uh, the point is that we're going to proceed very differently than all of these previous approaches, okay? So what are we going to do? Okay, so let me start with some general facts, which are were well known well before our, our work. Uh, of course, the natural idea is to test our minimizer omega against 
some uh, competitors by making a little perturbation, let's say flowing along a vector field X. Uh, and since our uh, cluster minimizes surface area under a volume constraint, then just by Lagrange multiplier theory, which you can make rigorous in this setting as well, we should have a Lagrange multiplier for each of our constraints, right? So we have Q constraints for the volume, right? So we should have Q dimensional Lagrange multiplier lambda living in our Q. But in fact, uh, there's one constraint which is redundant because the total mass of the space does not change, right? The sum of the uh, uh, volumes of the cells remains fixed. So this means that actually our Lagrange multiplier uh, lies in a co-dimension one subspace because uh, they all should sum to zero. Uh, and let me call the subspace E, okay? So we have this Lagrange multiplier lambda. And what do we know? We know that our uh, minimizer is a critical point modulo the volume constraint. This is called stationarity. So this means that the first variation of uh, area should be equal to the Lagrange multiplier multiplied by the first variation of our constraints, okay, by the first variation of volume. So you get our first equation. This is called stationarity. Uh, and the second piece of information that we have is that our uh, cluster is globally minimizing in particular, it's locally minimizing because this is called stability. Uh, if you work it out, it means that uh, whenever the first variation of volume is equal to zero, then the second variation of area, modulo, of course, the volume constraint, should be non negative. Just so local minimality under the perturbation. Okay. Okay. So these are a piece of information. Another classical, some other classical facts is that if, if I denote by sigma ij, the uh, intersection of uh, uh, the, the locus of points where uh, two cells meet. So the intersection of the reduced boundary of omega i with the reduced boundary of omega j. Then a uh, uh, well, uh, well-developed theory due to Almond from the 70s will tell us that this is a C infinity smooth manifold. So at least when, whenever two cells meet, we have beautiful regularity, C infinity smooth. But of course, that doesn't tell us anything about what happens when uh, five cells meet. This could be, as far as we know, a fractal. Okay, so I'm hiding various technicalities under the rug. We also have to use what you know, what, whatever geometric measure theory can tell us about the meeting points of three cells and of four cells. Uh, but uh, let's just talk about the simple uh, uh, regularity of what happens when two cells meet. And this is perfectly smooth. Okay, another classical fact is that if you take the first variation of uh, you take any hypersurface and you take its first variation of its surface area in a normal direction, this is going to be equal to the mean curvature of that surface. Uh, mean curvature just means trace of the second fundamental form, or if you will, the sum of the principal curvatures. This is just because the first derivative of the determinant is just equal to the trace of the of, of the of the differential, right? So you, you get the trace, you get the sum of the principal curvatures. Okay. So already we can um, you know we can uh, give a very nice geometric meaning to this stationarity condition. It turns out that this is essentially equivalent to the following two facts. First of all, if we just said that the first variation of area is the mean curvature, right? So if we if we make a little perturbation and move move some mass from the jth cell to the ith cell. So this scalar product will just give us lambda i minus lambda j. So this means that the mean curvature is constant along the whole interface. This is a very well-known condition called constant mean curvature or CMC. Okay, and moreover, it's actually, it has a separable form. It's of the form lambda i minus lambda j. Okay, so it's constant and it has a separable form. Uh, and if you will, this gives a physical interpretation of this uh, mean curvature. It means that the mean curvature is, it, so, so uh, it means that it's a good idea to think of these Lagrange multipliers as representing the pressure of air, which is trapped inside each of our bubbles. And the mean curvature is then just proportional to the difference between the pressures along the interface. Okay, so this makes a lot of sense uh, physically. And the second piece of information that we get is that the collection, uh, the union of all of these interfaces uh, should have no boundary in the whatever, in the distributional sense or in the current sense, which means that whenever three of these guys, three of these, these interfaces meet, then they must meet at 120 degree angles, okay? Because otherwise you would get a boundary. 
In other words, this is just the manifestation of the very elementary fact that if you have three unit vectors which sum to zero, then they must do so exactly at 120 degree angles. There's no other way. Okay, so this is just a geometrical explanation of why you see these 120 degree angles. Okay. So just I thought I'd give you a general background. Okay, so so far nothing was new. What about our contribution? Okay. What about our contribution? So our proof is divided into steps. And the first step is the most crucial for us. And we're going to use this property, uh, the local minimality, which I call stability, right? So uh, let me give this expression a name. Let me call this Q. This is called the index form. Uh, since we're taking two derivatives, this is obviously going to be a quadratic form. And this quadratic form is always non-negative whenever the, uh, you, you preserve volume to first order. And the idea is to use stability for a well-chosen vector. Field. That's, uh, as in a typical uh, geometric variational problem, the whole game. What is the right vector field to use? And the answer is we don't know. We don't know what's the right vector field to use. Uh, what we can do is choose it randomly for an appropriate family. Okay, This family is constructed so that this condition always holds. And... What we would like to do, and we cannot do it individually, but we can luckily ensure this on average, that this uh, index form on average has a sign. It's non-positive. If it's true on average, it means that there's at least one vector field for which this is non-positive. On the other hand, it's negative, right, by stability. So this means that actually have equality. This is equal to zero. This means that all of our inequalities were actually equalities and if so, uh, we're in a position that, in, in a good, in, in hopefully, we'll be able to read off some information about the curvature of our of our minimizer. This is our my notation for the second fundamental form. Okay, so the first step consists of showing that a minimizer should have the right curvature, flat in the Gaussian case or spherical in the other two cases, R n and S n. Why are we averaging here? The averaging is intended to make sure that we preserve these 120 degree angles. We don't know how to, to, to ensure this uh, 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 precisely. Every, every vector field could make some change, but on average, we're able to ensure this. And this is where we're using an averaging. Okay, so this is our strategy. And, and indeed, in the Gaussian setting, uh, we're able to fully, for, in all ranges of parameters, to invoke the strategy and show that indeed a minimizer must be flat. The second fundamental form must be equal to zero. Uh, the maximal case here actually requires some separate argument, uh, which I don't want to be, go into. Um, in Rn and Sn, we're not able to do the analogous thing for the maximal case, Q equals n plus two. So this is why we're not able to do that. Uh, however, we are able to treat the entire range Q at most n plus one. So just one below the maximal case. And in this case, we're able to show that a minimizer is spherical in the sense that the traceless part of the second fundamental form, that is the form minus its average value times the identity, this thing vanishes, which exactly is the thing that characterizes being spherical. Okay. Uh, and this already explains why things are harder in our N or on this N. And the reason is that we have these additional unknowns, right? So this is some type of um, you know philosophy, some moral reason why the case of our NSN is harder. Uh, we have this additional unknown parameters, uh, which we need to account for, right? So this is how well, why this, maybe maybe one reason why things are harder. And in fact, I'm not even telling you uh, the whole story. We actually have to combine several families of vector fields to get a sign here. Not just this averaging uh, of some non-conformal family, but actually also adding some conformal vector fields to the mix. And at the end, we're able to see a sign. And uh, really, this was the completely crucial step for us. Before this, we were stuck on this problem for literally years. Okay, there's a reason why it took four years uh, between the, the two works. Um, anyway, we get great information. This is a uh, great information for us. We're super happy. Uh, we know that these guys have the right curvature, but it could still be that every interface consists of several connected components, each of them will have the same curvature, but maybe they have different centers, right? Maybe this piece looks like this, this piece looks like this, you know, maybe they're oriented differently, okay? So this is something which can, we cannot exclude at this point. 
So this is why we need some extra steps, unless we're in the Gaussian case. In the Gaussian case, no problem. We can straight, we can jump straight to the last step. But in a Ren and Ascent, we have to work harder. And in these other two settings, what we are able to show for all ranges of parameters, we don't need to stop at six at quintuple. We can go all the way up to n plus one. We show that a minimizer, not only is it spherical, but it's actually a spherical Voronoi cluster. So let me explain what I mean. Okay. Um, so when you typically think of a Voronoi cluster, you probably think of this image, right? So you have a bunch of, let's say you're in the plane, you have a bunch of points, these black points, and you consider the corresponding Voronoi cells, which means you know the collection of all points which are closest to this point, rather than the other all of the other points. Okay, so you see the coloring. Uh, and in mathematical terms, this just means that omega i is the collection of all x's, where the Euclidean distance, or maybe Euclidean distance squared, uh, the minimum of this function is attained when j is equal to i. So the argument is for j equals i. Okay, this is the mathematical definition of a Voronoi cell in the usual Euclidean setting. However, in our situation, a spherical Voronoi cluster will look something like this. This, okay. So this is a spherical Voronoi cluster in R n, and this is a spherical Voronoi cluster on the sphere. They're obtained one for the other by stereographic projection. Okay, notice that the interfaces are, of course, no longer flat; they're spherical. But we have this, this desired property that they all meet at 120 degree angles. Okay, so what is the mathematical definition? You know what? Let me uh, let me actually. I, I'm running out of time. Uh, let, let me just say. Let me skip the number one here. Okay. Uh, basically, the thing that we were worried about before, uh, which is that these uh, interfaces do not lie on the same. Uh, sphere, they actually do. You see, so this is a connected component. This is another connected component. They actually do lie on a single sphere. Okay, so the thing that we were worried about before doesn't happen. So this is good. They all lie on a single geodesic sphere. And moreover, we have the following Voronoi representation. Let me describe to you how it looks like on the sphere. And you get the same situation on our end just by uh, taking stereographic projection to the sphere. So on the sphere, omega i, the i cell, is equal to the collection of points where the argument of not the Euclidean or spherical distance function is minimal, but rather this affine function. You take the location in P, you take the scalar product with some vector Cj, you add to it Kj, and this should be, so this affine function should be minimal, okay? Uh, equivalently, if you just rearrange uh, what this means, it means that every cell on the sphere is actually the intersection of a bunch of open half planes, okay? So in other words, every cell on the sphere is the intersection of the sphere with a convex polyhedron. So actually, you do get some type of convexity here, okay? We'll see in, in a second uh, a picture. Uh, but finally, the last piece of our theorem is that actually each of our cells is connected. Okay, so remember how in previous approaches, connectivity was the holy grail. We actually get connectedness of all cells. Okay, but unfortunately, it's not enough for us to fully conclude the conjecture. Uh, anyway, I don't have time to say uh, things about the proof. It does involve some, some topology and convex geometry, and again, some stability and some uh, arguments from elliptic regularity. Okay. Uh, let me just show you a, a bunch of pictures and explain where the convexity comes from, okay? So remember, this is our spherical Voronoi cluster on our end. You stereographically projected to projected onto Sn. You get this picture, okay? But still, it doesn't look convex. So to see the convexity, you have to look at this picture from the North Pole, from above. And if you look at it from the North Pole, right, it's going... So this is how it, this guy is how this is going to look from the North Pole. And if you project this picture down to the equatorial plane and maybe adjust the colors a bit, now you see this beautiful convex polyhedra, which I promised, right? So here you don't see any convexity, but after these transformations, you see that your cluster is actually the intersection of the sphere with these nice convex polyhedra. And convexity actually is used in the proof. Okay? Um, Okay, so uh, please tell me how much more time I have. I'm obviously way slower than I thought. Uh, no, Emmanuel, uh, 
we definitely have five more minutes if you need to. <laughs> tell me uh, how much, uh, well, yeah, t t tell me. Five, you want ten to after five. you. Well, no, no, don't, don't say that. I mean, I have okay. the time, but oh, okay, I'll, I'll try between five and ten. Okay. So at this point, what do we know? We know that our cluster is, uh, a, is a spherical Voronoi, which is great. The thing that we're missing, and this is the only thing that's missing, is, which, which is standing between us and fully resolving the conjecture, is to know that the, the only thing that's missing is the combinatorial structure. We still don't know that every pair of cells meet meets along a non-empty interface, right? And if we're able to show this, then we'd be done. It's a very simple fact that you can show that if you have a spherical Voronoi cluster so that every pair of cells meets along a non-empty interface, then this must be the standard bubble, okay? So we need to figure out the combinatorics. And so far, we've only used local arguments, right? We've made local perturbations. And now I claim that just using local arguments, this would never be enough to exclude these types of configurations, which are not standard bubbles, right? Because uh, this is obviously not a double bubble. These are two disjoint bubbles. This is not a standard triple bubble because this cell and this cell do not meet, right? Maybe it could look like this. Maybe, uh, you know, one of these Mickey Mouse ears actually lies in the interior here. So you can see that all pairs of cells meet except for this bubble and the exterior bubble, right? They don't meet. Right? We want to make sure that all pairs meet. To make to exclude these types of configurations, we must use a global argument, right? Because since in this example, each of these single bubbles is of course a, a local minimizer because every one of them separately is a global minimizer for the single bubble problem, right? So locally, we'll never be able to see that this is not a global minimizer. So what do we do? Now this is a standard argument from geometric measure theory is to say, well, okay, let's apply a global deformation. For instance, in this example, let's take these two bubbles and move them towards each other. We're just doing the local isometry, so we're not changing the volumes, we're not changing the surface area, right? So this is still, an, uh, if, if the initial guy was a minimizer, then also this guy is a minimizer. We're going to do this until the very first time that they touch, but this would give us an illegal singularity for an isoparametric uh, cluster as dictated by what's known from geometric measure theory. So geometric measure theory has actually classified the way that two, three, and four cells meet, but not more. And this is why we get stuck at double, triple, and for, and for quadruple, we have to exclude some additional cases, but this, this is why we get stuck at double, triple, and quadruple, okay? Because geometric measure theory uh, doesn't give us this extra information for meeting points of five cells. And in fact, it's known that many cells can meet in various exotic situations, which should, which do not occur for standard bubbles, okay? So at least I've explained to you why we get stuck at Q equals uh, five in this case. But I want to emphasize that the only remaining question is the combinatorial question, okay? And the last thing uh, I wanna say in my remaining time, my few minutes is, in that case, how on earth did we manage to resolve the Gaussian case in all ranges of parameters? How do we manage to bypass this obstruction? So this will be the last thing I want uh, I want to mention. The way we did this, and this is a method, an, another idea, uh, which works well whenever you have finite volume. So it's not going to work on our end, but it could. It, we made it work in the Gaussian setting. And in principle, this should also work in the spherical setting, but we haven't managed to push it through so far which is to consider the isoparametric profile of our, of our space, okay? So the isoparametric profile, uh, it eats a vector of volumes, okay? So volumes, of course, uh, live on the simplex, on a Q minus one dimensional simplex, because these are all non-negative numbers, which let's say sum up to one, let's renormalize to make everything into a probability measure. So they all sum up to one. So they live in this Q minus one dimensional simplex and it spits out uh, the total surface area of the, of the most efficient configuration, right? So it's the infimum over all surface areas of clusters having uh, volume vector equal to little v, okay? So this is how this isoparametric profile is defined. And similarly, let's define the model isoparametric profile, I sub m. Just do exactly the same, only consider the conjectured minimizers now. So this is equal to the surface area of the conjecture minimizer having volume exactly equal to V, okay? 
So obviously the real profile can only be smaller than the model profile. That's exactly the conjecture. The conjecture is that it cannot be strictly smaller, that you cannot do better than the conjectured minimizers, right? So what we actually want to show is the converse inequality, this inequality. Okay, that's our goal to show this inequality. And by induction on Q, on the number of cells, we can actually assume that our two functions coincide on the boundary of our simplex, because on the boundary of our simplex, at least one of the volumes that generates to zero. So this means that we've effectively reduced the number of cells and we can use induction. And hence we can assume that these two functions do coincide on the boundary, okay? So our observation here in the Gaussian setting, uh, you could do a similar but more complicated uh, uh, equation uh, on the sphere. We've noticed that actually the following fully nonlinear yet elliptic PDE holds for the model profile in the Gaussian set setting. If you calculate the Hessian of the model profile, it turns out that this is negative definite. So if you take a minus sign, this is positive definite and hence invertible. So you invert it, And then you calculate the trace the original function, function. Okay, so this is an elliptic, albeit fully nonlinear PD. So the idea was that if we could show that the following partial differential inequality holds for the real profile, okay, the real profile, we don't know a priori that it's smooth, so we mean in the viscosity sense, but it's exactly the same inequality just as the equality case for the model profile. If we're able to to show this partial differential inequality, then since our functions by induction, we can assume that they coincide on the boundary, then by an application of the maximum principle, since everything is elliptic, we'll be able to conclude our desired inequality. Okay, this was our idea. Okay, so now this, re this basically reduces things to getting upper bounds, sharp upper bounds on the Hessian of I. Okay, and how do we do this? Now we're back back to our local situation. Now we just have to apply local perturbations to get information on the Hessian, okay? Um, so I'm basically out of time. I'm not going to tell you how we do this. Basically everything, if you wanna get an upper bound on the Hessian of I, everything boils down to understanding how this quadratic form Q looks like, okay? Uh, so you make a computation. You'll see that this quadratic form actually has a, a boundary term, which depends on these triple points whenever three interfaces meet. And this boundary term is kind of nasty. It doesn't really have a sign. It depends on the curvature. But there's also a uh, the, the main part of this form, which is just the integral over the collection of uh, interfaces. And this form is governed by a classical operator from differential geometry called the Jacobi operator. The Jacobi operator depends on the Laplacian of these interfaces, on the Ritchie curvature of your space, and on the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the curvature of the second fundamental form. Okay, and at this point, we already have great information. In particular, in the Gaussian setting, things are great because in the Gaussian setting, the curvature is zero. So this means that this term actually vanishes. Curvature is zero. This thing vanishes. And it turns out that the Jacobi operator in the Gaussian setting is trivial. In particular, we find this beautiful trivial eigenfunction. The Jacobi operator of the constant function is equal to itself. And using this, so, so really things become like a spectral analysis at this point. Uh, and using this uh, trivial observation, we're able to construct our family of vector fields, which enable us to get the sharp partial differential inequality and conclude using uh, uh, the maximum principle, our desired inequality. And this is how we, and, and then you can also determine the uniqueness. This is how we get, how, this is how we manage to resolve the Gaussian case um, completely. Uh, so why doesn't this work on the sphere? Because it doesn't, because in the sphere, uh, curvature is not zero. So we have still a boundary term. We have this term. And uh, we cannot write explicitly the vector fields that we would like to use. We know various things about them and we can resolve some partial cases. And we're epsilon close to doing the full thing, but not quite. Uh, so using some additional tricks, which I do not describe here, we're able to do the quintuple case with the sphere and therefore get the quintuple case in our n, as you ask, by an approximation argument in which uniqueness is lost, okay? And so far, this is what we're able to do. Okay, so this is kind of the last idea I wanted to hash out, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. That was a great talk. Are there any questions or comments?
Um, okay, if not, <laughs> let's thank Emmanuel again. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week this time. Um, I think it's the last uh, talk of the term next week. <laughs>